So um, what I want to chat with you a little bit about today is who in the U.S. is accruing the climate debt, who in the U.S. particularly is paying the cost, and where we can all go from here. Because as my title indicates, that we, I do believe that another world is possible, but in order for us to get there, because of the uh, influence that the U.S. has, another U.S. is really necessary in terms of how we, uh, how we interact. So as we know, we're living in a world, and we're, we are living in a country where powerful forces are determined to maintain the wealth of the 1% to the detriment of the health and the well-being of the 99%. With that, our natural resources are being commoditized or reckless, recklessly disregarded to catastrophic effects. We are inundated with consumerism and excessive waste. In the U.S., we generate over 356 billion pounds of waste every year. What we do, what do we do with the majority of our waste? We have kind of two Bs around that. We either bury it or we burn it. There are over 100 waste burning biomass facilities in the U.S., again, that emit excessive amounts of emissions that are driving climate change. We have, the biomass incinerators emit toxins like cadmium, arsenic, lead into the atmosphere, as well as greenhouse gases like methane and carbon dioxide. We also have the, we also, oh sorry, going back to that, 85 of 107 large-scale biomass plants operating in the U.S. have been cited for federal or state regulate, state violations of clean air or water um, laws over the past five years. And that's important because biomass facilities and landfill facilities, which we'll talk a little bit more about, are disproportionately located in communities of color or low-income communities in the U.S. So that's where we start to get at the fact that these, these, these facilities are both driving climate change through their emissions of greenhouse gases, but they're also affecting the health and well-being of the communities that are the unwitting host of these facilities. So we have over 3,000 active landfills and over 10,000 old municipal landfills in the U.S. And those landfills also are one of the major emitters of, of methane. Um, this is a story of a person, um, Sheila Holt Orsted, who lives in a place called Dixon, Tennessee in the U.S. And she lived next to a landfill which became, um, which became compromised. And uh, that means that the, the stuff in the landfill got into the water supply. They drank that water for 10 years. A number of the folks in the family, basically everyone in the family actually ended up with either some kind of birth defects in terms of the children that they had or some kind of rare or common forms of cancer, but it was an extremely high cancer cluster in that area. African American families, they, the, the African American families received letters saying that it was okay to drink the water for those 10 years. The white families in that community received a letter saying that they should not drink the water and they were put on an alternate water supply. And unfortunately, this isn't an uncommon situation that happened in Dixon. It, it happens all too often in, in different communities in the U.S. So, the other thing that we are looking at in terms of our exposure is our exposure to harmful energy production processes. We have an oil and gas based system where this high school is the Cesar Chavez High School in Houston, Texas, which has five oil refineries within a 10 mile radius of that school. And the black smoke coming out of that, those plants are part of the, part of the daily ingestion of the students, largely African American and Latino students, who go to that school. We have the BP oil drilling disaster, which took the lives of 11 workers and destroyed the livelihoods and health of countless others, also eroding the culture and the, of the indigenous and other communities across the Gulf Coast. That's a couple of signs that, that were in that community after the BP oil drilling disaster happened. We have drilling for natural gas, which is contaminating the water supply of hapless neighbors with no power over this exposure and with a potential tie, and, and Doug can tell us more about this, although I think it's pretty loosely being made now, to potentially the size of the increase in seismic activity. I've heard that, but again, I think it's largely un, you know, unproven, but who knows where that's going. Uh, we have um, we have uh, coal mining that happens where which at, which the, the the process of coal mining itself puts people at risk in terms of the uh, the workers. Oops. We have um, mountaintop removal in terms of blasting the, the the tops off mountains, destroying landscapes, and also following um, water in the communities that surround those, and, and also disturbing the foundations of the homes that are near those um, near those mountains. We have um, large scale, and so 378 coal fired power plants in populous areas across the U.S. These plants are primarily in communities of color and low income communities, 
and they're spewing mercury, arsenic, lead, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxide, and as well as carbon dioxide. They're the number one contributor to carbon dioxide, actually, as we all know. We see how this affects communities in terms of high rates of asthma, birth defects, heart disease, and lung cancer. And with African-American families, they are more likely to live next to a coal fire power plant. And we have African-American adults more likely to die from lung disease, but far less likely to smoke. We have African-American children who are three times more likely to be admitted to hospital for asthma attacks, and twice as likely to die from asthma. This is a gentleman who's actually uh, fishing right out of a lake that's right next to one of those coal-fired power plants. And again, we all know with acid rain, the types of things that go into those lakes. But he is one of the many subsistence fisher folks who fish out of those waters just to put food on the table for their family, even though they, they might, may or may not know the risks of, of, of doing that fishing. This is the, a, a major coal ash spill that happened a few years ago that in Tennessee, again, um, affecting, again, lives of many. This is one of the houses that was destroyed by that coal ash spill, and the, the effects still go on today. This is a family, a Navajo family, that lives in New Mexico near uh, four coal fire power plants, all within, um, within 50 miles of where they live. And they, they see the effects in terms of their health outcomes and so forth in their communities. So next we're going to do a little bit of a, as we transition to talking a little bit about climate change, we'll do a little bit of a musical interlude, just a few minutes of it, and I'll tell you where to stop. Lighten it up a little bit. This is from a youth group in Minnesota who decided to express their concerns around climate change. Oops. Oh, can we? The, the, the lyrics are actually going to clash. We need to take control. We need to take control. We need to take control. So I don't know if it, it kind of lost the effect with you not being able to really jam to it there. But um, <laughs> but uh, these are some, a youth group that was really that that are again a number of the, a couple of the kids in that group have asthma. They really were speaking out about both how the different pollutants are affecting their their health how climate change is affecting their communities, and how they feel powerless in terms of their politicians when they talked before about um, them not being in their category, meaning that they're not in the category of the people that politicians actually care about. So, um, so I really wanted to put that for you to just kind of give a sense of the voice of the youth around these issues. So, okay. all right, so um, just a little bit of a, uh, unfortunately not so comic relief, but about where we are in terms of our climate denial. Um, for better or worse, as, as Douglas and, and others will, will point out, we are in a point where we are maybe becoming a little bit less denialist than we have been in the past due to climate change really being in our face a little bit more than it has been before um, for some communities. Oh, sorry. Um, this is a Hurricane Katrina, a satellite image of Hurricane Katrina. And again, um, uh, Hurricane Katrina was a, was, a, was a disaster that disproportionately affected low-income communities, communities of color. 
and sorry, my clicker isn't being as responsive uh, as uh, I'm not sure. Should I? Oh, you're good. You just didn't touch on me. Okay, good. So, and that's another image of Hurricane Katrina. Um, and, and then uh, the uh, increase in tornadoes, again, and Douglas can correct, correct me on that, not necessarily tied to climate change, but we're just seeing a shift in overall weather patterns. And this is actually the devastation that was wrought by one of the hurricane, uh, one of the tornadoes that happened last year in Alabama. And that's a family that um, had just actually set up their house like eight months before. They had moved out of the city and they moved out to the to the uh, to this rural area, deciding that they're going to really um, um, start their lives over, not start to, but transition their lives into a, a slower, um, nicer life. And within eight months, their entire dream was gone. And they didn't have enough insurance money to rebuild, so they really had to kind of pack up their dreams and go back to the apartment in the city. And that's a, um, a flooded home in Port Gibson, Mississippi, and as we see kind of uh, rising, sea, rising sea levels, oops, as we see more in terms of, um, of flooding and, and, and rains and so forth, then we're, we'll be seeing more of that type of image, unfortunately. Then this next slide is in that same area, which is actually has a um, nuclear facility right next to it. So that nuclear facility, as the waters rose, people were concerned about what would happen with that nuclear facility if it ended up being breached. And unfortunately, too many communities are right next to, um, and disproportionately certain communities, African American communities, low income communities, are next to these types of facilities. So we also have the issue around ships and agricultural yields, which um, we see the, the, the pavement literally dry, I mean the earth literally drying up in terms of the yields from the earth. And we see what that looks like in communities. There's certain communities that already don't have access to, um, to a good supermarket where they can get foods. The next slide shows what it actually looks like in terms of the types of best foods that are available for certain low-income communities where they, they have only access to foods with preservatives, sugars, sweet, um, salt, salt, and so forth that make their health worse already. And then on the other side, people who have better means have access to fruits, vegetables, life-sustaining foods. And that's only gonna get worse as we see um, the shifts in agricultural yields. And then sea level rise um, right in the U.S. Um, well, we see this image actually from um, the Maldives where they had their uh, cabinet meeting underwater to, to show the impact of, of climate change um, that, that the Maldives is facing now. And then in the U.S., we have on the left the Kivalina Islands in Alaska that will have to be moving within, within um, 20 years. And then on the right is Tipito, Louisiana, which is also in the same situation of having to move within 20 years. And then, then moving on. So this is just a quick slide again in terms of who is accruing the debt, debt what, where that money is, where money is going, and who's paying. These are, this is a list of, of energy companies and the millions of dollars that they're spending on, on anti-regulatory lobbying. So right now we're actually trying to advance a carbon pollution standard to stop the pollution that's coming from coal-fired power plants. Um, we, last year we were working on a mercury and air toxics rule to also stop um, pollution coming from new and and some old coal-fired power plants. And this is the millions of dollars that are being invested by energy companies to stop those kind of initiatives. And we'll quickly go through the rest, I'm completely out of time. And I won't even go through this one, yeah. <laughs> so, and then the next slide. So then, really transitioning to another way. We're really focusing on now initiatives to move us into a new vision of what we want our communities to look like and what we want a society to look like. So energy efficiency, that's a weatherization image. Um, better transportation that, that, that focuses on um, uh, low emissions transportation, uh, wind energy, solar energy, next slide, solar energy, um, and then the next slide, uh, that's a church that's completely off the grid, they get all their energy from solar, next slide, and then moving on, um, educating ourselves as a teaching that we did in one of the communities that actually shut down the two coal fire power plants that we were focusing on in that, in that very, in that very teaching. Then the next slide, testifying at the EPA for those very rules that I talked about, the carbon pollution standard is the rule that we're testifying on right there to, to, um, lower, to uh, lower the emissions that are coming from, um, exist, well, from new coal-fired power plants and, and other plants. And we're actually now lobbying to um, lower the emissions or to make sure that existing plants won't be able to improve as much as well. Making sure we actually have research, that's a group of university organizations getting together to talk about sustainability. Um, really emphasizing green, green entrepreneurship and making sure that we're actually getting out there really tackling corporate control because we talked about how they have whole sway over these issues. Again, around uh, focusing on corporate control in terms of financing. Very good. <laughs> on the next slide. 
Um, again, same, making sure we're out there raising our voices. Um, same thing, actually pushing for an ordinance in Chicago. Again, they were successful in shutting down those two plants, so it shows it is successful. And then making sure that we actually are getting out there and being civically engaged, so we don't have politicians that are being bought off by industry. We have politicians that are really being the voice and the power of the people. Next slide. Same, youth, making sure the youth are at the, at the front. We saw the, the, how much wisdom they were spouting in that song, so we want to make sure that they're in the leadership. Next slide. And then also making sure we have co local cooperative communities that focus on local food movements and other types of things. Next slide. Same type of thing. That, that first slide was in Berkeley, California. That was in Pittsburgh. And then really getting together to, to do all of this. So thank you very much. Sorry, I was talking like an auctioneer <laughs> towards the end, but my time was running out. So thank you all. Thanks, Jackie. And uh, next up is uh, Mary Manette, uh, Director of Environmental Education and Advocacy for the Evangelical Regional Association. So when I first started working for the church about seven years ago, the way that we spoke to the impacts of climate change was very different from the way we speak to it today. We were mostly talking about our work in developing countries, our, our relief work, our development work that we, that we fund and do on the ground. Uh, uh, to address uh, impacts of climate change. And we mostly were talking about uh, international aid and the need to, uh, to beef up our adaptation efforts globally. But then Katrina happened. Um, and our church has a very strong domestic disaster response component. Uh, we raise money for domestic disaster response. We Marshall volunteers, we go into communities through our social ministry organizations and, and help clean up, we help rebuild. After Katrina, um, we, we raised millions of dollars. We've had volunteers going, in some cases annually, from, from our congregations to help in both the cleanup and the rebuilding effort. We've had two national youth gatherings in New Orleans, uh, each of which brought 35,000 youth and adult leaders to New Orleans to do uh, service projects um, that were aimed towards helping in the recovery. And I can tell you, because I was there last summer with our last youth gathering, that uh, New Orleans is not, has not recovered fully, and it may not ever uh, fully recover. A lot of the low-income people uh, that were in the communities that were hardest hit by Katrina um, were moved to other places in the country and were likely not back. And these were people who had very deep roots uh, in that community. The Lower Ninth Ward, particularly, had a very high rate of home ownership. People will not be able to rebuild those homes because they didn't have good insurance. Uh, they just don't have the means. A lot of them have left the, the area altogether. And, um, and something, something that's something that we will never get back. Um, now with Sandy, I mean, we see a lot of parallels. Um, there are communities that have been really hard hit, that um, that have a long history, uh, that are, are either working class or low income along the New Jersey Shore, on Staten Island, uh, in, in Metro New York, that may never become what they were before the storm. But, uh, but our churches will be there. Our disaster response efforts will, will be involved. I, I'm, I'm sure this is going to be another multi-year um, effort involving thousands of people across the country really doing their best to help that area build. The other, the other aspect of, of our ministries in the, in the U.S. as a church that we've, we've begun to talk more about are the impacts of our dependence of fossil fuel particularly on rural communities. As a, as a church, we actually are very rural. About 50% of our congregations are in small towns or uh, rural communities. And um, a lot of the, the fossil fuel development that's going on in the U.S. right now is, is in these rural, is, is, is in very rural areas. Um, Mount top removal in Appalachia, in Appalachia um, hydraulic fracturing for natural gas and oil in western North Dakota, in rural Pennsylvania. Um, Western North Dakota and North Pennsylvania are very Lutheran areas of the country. You may not know that. Um, something like 25% of the population of North Dakota is baptized Lutheran. 
So we have a lot of congregations in these communities that are, um, are dealing with hydraulic fracture. In that case, it's not so, so much the environmental impacts, it's the social impacts of, this oil and gas, of, of the gas development. Uh, these are tiny, tiny communities. Uh, there are hundreds of workers coming in to, to work in the fracking um, industry. They don't have enough housing. Um, Elderly, elderly renters who lived in the community for many, many years are getting kicked out of their rental homes so that they can, um, the landlords can turn the, the properties around and rent to the gas companies um, for these people who are coming into to the frack. So there's this huge problem with lack of affordable housing and with homelessness. Um, our, our social service agency in North Dakota has, has turned from all of the other work that it does to start to have to build affordable housing in these communities and has been doing and having to do a lot of advocacy in uh, the state capital to get more funds to build those home, uh, affordable homes. So it's, it's just a, it's a growing problem and it really is um, due to um, our dependence as a country on, on fossil fuels. Um, another example in, um, in West Virginia, um, our, our social service organization uh, had to, uh, was supplying water to a community near a, a coal, an abandoned coal mine. Um, their wells were completely contaminated. They had um, no access to to public water systems, so the social ministry organization was paying to bring in water a couple of times a month so that these people would have um, fresh water to drink and um, they couldn't even shower in the, the water that was coming out of their wells. And they've, um, they've been able to do um, advocacy in their community in the state capital. They're now getting um, uh, hooked up to the nearest public water facility, but it took a lot of, of, of time and effort and, funding to get to that point. So we're seeing these impacts as a church uh, on the, the different aspects of our ministries. I, I really do believe that it's it's helping to, to hammer the message home with, with people of faith in our, in our country that climate change is real, that climate change is happening, and that climate change is not going to, it's, it's not just going to affect people over there who we may care about because of the work that we do in the world, but it's not as immediate, that it's, it's happening in our own, our own towns. Um, and I, I, it really does give us an opportunity to begin to talk to different people and build different coalitions uh, around solutions and around making our communities much more resilient. Um, we, are, we are working to um, strengthen the coal-fired power plant rules that Jackie mentioned. Um, the, uh, the faith community mobilized around the common periods. Uh, we have people around the country speaking at the hearings. Um, everybody from one of my bishops to pastors in some of our congregations who got up and, and spoke to how uh, these rules would impact their lives. Um, we are, we are taking our role as sort of a, a safe space in a community very seriously to, to begin dialogues about new ways of looking at our energy future. In West Virginia, the West Virginia Council of Churches is, is talking about trying to convene uh, a dialogue between stakeholders about a future beyond coal for that state, um, which would be a revolutionary thing in an area that has, has been mining coal for um, several centuries. Is, very poor and has been poor um, for most of its history. Um, and um, one thing that I, I always I always find really hopeful with my own denomination is the number of churches that that see climate change as a very serious issue, that look at their own carbon footprint and begin to take steps to um, to reduce that footprint. Um, we have. Um, they, uh, it, the White House just honored the first 28 congregations nationally to achieve Energy Star status, which is a certification program that the government does for energy savings in buildings. Uh, four of those 28 would be three congregations. Uh, my own uh, denominational headquarters is Chicago. We own, we own an office building. Uh, just got Energy Star certified last month. 
Um, so this is something that's happening all over the country. They're, they're taking measures to reduce their energy uh, use. They're putting in solar panels. They're, they're uh, installing geothermal heating and cooling systems. Uh, they really see it as part of their, not only part of, of a way to, to save money in the congregation, but also part of the ministry and their mission in the world. So I, I really do see that there are, are ways to build some new coalitions um, between different, different voices, people of faith, uh, environmental groups, um, and to, to really move this issue forward, particularly with, with events like Sandy, where it really has become clear that this is our future and that we all need to, to look at it together and start to build a more resilient community in the United States as well. And uh, batting clean up as I mentioned, Amanda and Nisha. stories and presentations very much so. I think that in order for us to achieve a paradigm shift that we're going to have to be communicating more and sharing our stories. So thank you for allowing me to do that. Uh, so I come from Sea Caucus, New Jersey. We are, I, I work with the uh, TAL as an environmental coordinator. We really, really care about the TAL. We're, we do, uh, we have an award-winning environmental committee. We uh, banned styrofoam. We have large-scale uh, solar projects going on. We educate our youth. We have many different kinds of green events in the town. Um, and we really, really love our town because um, it's a very critical, it actually has a very critical habitat. Sea Caucus is located in the Meadowlands. Um, it's in the wetlands region. And uh, obviously, we are very prone to flooding. And uh, we really noticed how vulnerable we are to flooding during Hurricane Irene. Um, we literally just, a lot of people actually just uh, remodeled their homes, threw out their carpets, you know, uh, fixed up their, you know, repainted their houses, um, and then Hurricane Sandy hit. And we were seriously not uh, expecting um, a, a storm of that magnitude. Uh, climatologists have confirmed that uh, Hurricane Sandy's intensity was due to a 2 to 5 degree increase in the surface of our oceans. Is that right, Doctor? <laughs> and um, and so uh, uh, we were definitely not expecting um, such a, a storm of this magnitude to come to our town. I actually worked for the community, um, and th for about two weeks, I had to put down all of us had to put down our uh, our work and start working for the um, for the local government and. Um, for the emergency responders. And so I was sitting in the office basically um, answering, making and taking about 500 emergency calls, um, making sure that people uh, were okay, that senior citizens uh, were, were warm and were fed, and people with medical conditions um, you know, had what they needed to survive. Uh, the mayor, my boss, who also actually lost his home uh, to Hurricane Sandy, was frantically looking around for food and water um, and ways to keep people um, you know, busy during the storm. We actually, in really nice story, we actually had uh, the local movie theater give us about like 2,000 uh, movie tickets so that people could go watch movies because uh, it was actually, you know, nobody had power and everyone was bored, I guess. Um, so, Jersey, uh, nearby in New York City, in, in Jersey City. This is Hoboken here. 
Um, but like I said, the most incredible part of it was uh, seeing how people actually came together um, and to help each other out. We were actually the only gas station open in the entire county. Uh, so all emergency responders, uh, policemen, you name it, FEMA, was in our town waiting on very, very long gas lines. Um, we actually held a barbecue in my community to um, help those that, that were without power at the Sea Caucus Exchange. Uh, and we saw a lot of uh, coming together also in the political arena. Uh, elected officials actually um, put their political differences aside to begin to work together on such an important issue as affecting millions of people. Um, this, is, uh, this is Governor Christie and Obama, and um, as Doug mentioned, uh, you know, Christie is a Republican and called out um, uh, President Obama so many times on his lack of leadership. Um, and here's him working together and praising Obama for how well he did. And this is actually um, Bloomberg talking with President Obama. Uh, Bloomberg actually, he's the mayor of New York City, he actually said that he would not be endorsing anybody, but after Hurricane Sandy, he decided to endorse President Obama because he had a stance on uh, climate change. So basically, as a young person, I'm here with a, a youth delegation um, to, basically, to basically share our stories and to um, highlight all the impacts that we are having here in the United States from climate change and how we are doing so much, as, as much as we possibly can at the local level to um, transition uh, and as a bottom-up approach um, to a sustainable economy. And I think that current generations um, understand that our future is going to be drastically different and that, uh, you know, it really, it, it, it's up to us to determine whether or not those changes are going to be positive or are going to be uh, negative. And you know what, I can actually completely understand um, what some of the, you know, climate ske skeptics might think. I actually graduated high school thinking that climate change was a hoax and that there was nothing that we could possibly do to, uh, to change our futures. Um, until I went to college and I learned the basic chemistry behind climate change and understood that, wow, this is what I need to be doing. This is what we all need to be doing. And I was scared and angry that um, I was not being told that this was going to be, uh, this was our future, that, that we have a grim future looking ahead if we don't do anything about it right now. And so um, uh, I'm hoping that uh, this conference will really show, uh, really prove that people really care about climate change, that we're going to start taking action on climate change, and that we are doing all that we can here at the local level and hoping that um, that our leaders are meeting us uh, halfway. Thank you. Thank you. This concludes uh, the formal part of our program. I'd like to open it up for Q&A uh, for the next few minutes. Folks have questions for our speakers. We do have Mike in the back of the room.